Well, good morning, and welcome along to Amford Evangelical Church's online service. Uh, we're meeting together in person once more, 10.30 in Llanderbia Memorial Hall. But for those of you who are unable to gather with us, we're thrilled to be able to welcome you along to this digital format. My name's Sammy, I'm one of the leaders, one of the pastors. If you're new, then that's just to fill you in on that. And it's my duty this morning to welcome and to lead us in prayer and praise of our glorious God. I wanted to begin with these words, Psalm 111, and then to consider them for a moment. Psalm 111 says this, Hallelujah, I will praise the Lord with all my heart. In the assembly of the upright in the congregation, the Lord's works are great, and they are studied by all who delight in them. The Lord's works are great, and they are studied by all who delight in them. I don't know what your habits, your routines are, whether you make a, a daily or a, a seasonal commitment to stop and to ponder what it is that God has done in our world and in our lives. But Sundays appear like a little interruption in the routines of our week, an opportunity, an oasis perhaps, to stop, to look to look to and to reflect on what God has done. It's my prayer, it's my hope that as we've gathered together in person over in Llandabir or online as you're with us now this morning, that you will be coming and you will be studying the works of God with us, looking to this great one who can fill our hearts with praise because it's delightful when you stop and you see what God has done. John's going to be preaching for us later on in our service. We're carrying on our little series looking at folks who interacted with Jesus before the cross and after the resurrection. A very famous passage we're dealing with today. So we'll pray now for John. And we'll pray for one another before we sing God's praises. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who works in the secret, in mysterious, in hidden ways. But two, you are a God who works out there, plain in the open. We thank you for your word, which sometimes peels back the, 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 um, the, the curtain so that we can see the two of those blended together. Ways perhaps in which you have been at work in our world that we wouldn't have recognised unless it was singled out. Lord, we thank you as well that you are a God who has just done such obvious things. We think of all that we've been celebrating at Easter, the big public life and death and resurrection of Jesus. We thank you that there are no secrets there. Lord, help us this morning to look up from ourselves, to look up from our circumstances and to look at you, to look at the Son whom you sent, whom you have raised, whom you have gladly received back to yourself. Help us to delight in what you have done and to be changed as we consider it for ourselves. Be with John as he speaks, be with us as we carry on in prayer and song and what have you. And make this morning an interruption in that normal weekly pattern where we delight in you and our hearts are filled with praise because of what you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus 
be talking about the resurrection again, thinking about the significance of that, thinking about our doubts about the resurrection. It's a pretty big thing to believe, isn't it, that Jesus rose from the dead. So today I want to read you a little bit more of the story from John chapter 20, if you want to follow along in the Bible. Um, Let me read you from John chapter 20, verse 19. This is what happened to the disciples, but there was someone missing. So today we're going to look at the story of Thomas. John 20 from verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, the day that Jesus had risen, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. But there was somebody missing. Skip down to verse 24 and we'll see that Thomas, now Thomas, also called Didymus, which means twin, One of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came that night. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. 
But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus told him, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who've not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which aren't recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Should we pray and ask God to help us? Uh, it's a famous story, a really important story, a story that will teach us a lot and hopefully help us a lot. So let's ask God to help us um, hear what he wants us to hear today. Lord God, we pray as we come to your word now, as we come to this story of Thomas, Lord, we thank you for putting it into the, into the Bible so we can read about somebody who doubts just like we do. Um, Lord, we pray as we come to it, you would help us to understand, you would speak to us, you give us your spirit to, uh, to help us recognise our doubts. Lord, to help us deal with our doubts, that we might come and believe in you and have life in your name. Amen. I wonder if you're somebody who doubts. I wonder if you are like Thomas. We often call him Doubting Thomas, which I hope by the end of today you'll see is a little bit unfair on him. Um, but I wonder if you have doubts like his. He seems like a really practical guy. The other times you meet him in the gospel, you can look back if you want through it and see if you can find a couple of times where he says really practical things. He wants to know details about plans, about the future. And so when he's out, he's missing. We don't know why, if he's out getting milk or maybe he was, he was out for some, some other reason that maybe wasn't just mundane. Maybe he didn't want to be around with the disciples, but we don't know. He wasn't there. He misses out on seeing Jesus. And when they're all telling him, we've seen him. It's true what the women told us on that morning, that he was alive, we've seen him, we've touched him, he spoke to us, he was right here in this room, but Thomas won't believe it. Thomas is doubts, uh, Thomas doubts. And he doesn't just say, I can't believe it, as if and I need a little bit more evidence, but he says, I won't believe it. The first thing we see in the story is, it's a story of stubborn doubt, isn't it? Stubborn doubt, the doubt of Thomas where he says, I, I won't believe, I have to see it. This is my condition of believing in Jesus, of trusting that it's true. Before I have any of this kind of joy, before I will even think about it, I'm a practical person, a logical person. Maybe you say the same thing. I have to see the marks in his hands. I have to put my fingers in there, touch that wound in his side where the spear went in. We all know what happened and I'm not believing it until I see it for myself. Seeing for Thomas was believing. I wonder if you have doubts like that. I wonder if maybe you're not a Christian yet. Maybe you're just tuning in because you're kind of interested, I don't know, for whatever reason, but you don't really believe it. You've got plenty of doubts. But it's not just people who aren't Christians who have doubts. Lots of Christians that I know have doubts at one time or another. Sometimes, especially if you've been a Christian for a while, those doubts can be pretty scary. When you wake up one morning or in the middle of the night and you're just not really sure if it's true. If you feel a little bit crazy for thinking that there's anything beyond death, that there is a God. Maybe it's something in your life that's really shaken you, some suffering in your own life or in the life of somebody that you love that's made you, made you doubt whether God is there at all. Or maybe you don't doubt his existence, but you doubt his goodness. And you feel like, is he playing with me like a rat in a cage? C.S. Lewis's famous phrase, is he there but just not very good? Does he really care about me? Would he want anything to do with me considering what I've done? Often we can have all sorts of different kinds of doubts, not just before you become a Christian, you know, questions that you have before you take the plunge. But we can have doubts when we have been Christians for a long time and those can be really unsettling. So I wanted to encourage you to begin with um, just to know that doubts can be quite good. Doubts can be quite healthy. Um, Tim Keller says that, without some, that a faith without some doubts is like a human body without any antibodies, a human body without an immune system. He says, people who blithely go through life too busy or indifferent to ask hard questions about why they believe, find themselves defenseless against 
the experience of tragedy or the probing questions of a smart skeptic. See, not having doubts or not recognising your doubts can leave you defenceless like somebody without an immune system. You kind of have to hide away from questions or hide away and deny suffering. A person's faith can collapse almost overnight if she's failed over the years to listen patiently to her own doubts, which should only be discarded after long reflection. Believers should acknowledge and wrestle with doubts, not only their own, but their friends and neighbours. It's no longer sufficient to hold beliefs just because you inherited them. Only if you struggle long and hard with objections to your faith will you be able to provide grounds for your own beliefs to yourself and to your friends around you. And just as important for our current situation, such a process will lead you, even after you come to a position of strong faith, to respect and understand those who doubt. So do you see he's saying? Um, he's saying that doubts are helpful. Doubts aren't something you should press down or deny or try and ignore or forget about. Doubts can be like antibodies, like something that actually, when you're dealing with a doubt or dealing with a question, after you've dealt with it, it can leave you stronger, in a stronger position in your own faith, because you don't have this niggling doubt in the back of your head, because you found out something new about Jesus that you never really realised before, that you actually did have a strong foundation for your faith that you never quite come to recognise. Doubts can leave you stronger, and they can also leave you in a stronger position to help other people who are struggling, friends and neighbours and family who have big, big questions, or other Christians who come along and say, have you ever thought about this question? I kind of didn't want to say it out loud, but I've sometimes wondered if God is really good. I've sometimes wondered if he's even there, and maybe you could help them, because you've dealt with being honest about those doubts before. So doubts can be a good thing. They can be like antibodies that help you build up strength in your body to deal with big questions, to deal with suffering. But I'm not sure that Thomas's doubts are a particularly healthy kind of doubts. Did you see that? We noted it already, didn't we? He doesn't just say, I'm struggling to believe. I can't quite believe. He says, I won't believe. He's almost putting conditions up. Conditions that Jesus has to meet. He's almost putting Jesus in a lower position and himself up here and saying, okay, if you really want me to believe in you, you've got to come and meet my expectations. That's a pretty dangerous place to be. But we don't just meet stubborn doubt in this story. We meet patient love. Patient love is the second thing I want you to see. I wonder if you heard it as we went through. What happens a week later? The disciples have been joyfully trying to persuade Thomas. That um, In verse 25, it's a present continuous thing. They keep saying, come on, Thomas, we've seen him. It's true. Look, our lives are changed. But Thomas won't believe. But what happens when a week later, they're locked in that room again. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you again. And then he looks at Thomas, comes over to Thomas in particular. He says, Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Isn't that a gracious thing of Jesus to do? Isn't, doesn't that show real beautiful patience? Jesus knows everything he said. Jesus knows everything he's done. Jesus knows his stubborn heart that won't believe. And he says, Thomas, come on then. Let me give you what you need, even though you shouldn't need it. I mean, what did he say at the end of that story? He said, blessed are those who haven't seen and yet have believed. That's a, you could say that's a way of saying it's possible to believe, to have the blessing of knowing Jesus really is alive. It's possible to believe and to know that it's true without seeing him face to face. I mean, that's it's all our position, isn't it? As Christians, 2,000 years later, it's possible to believe. But Thomas, I'm going to give you even more than you need. I'm going to be gracious to you and patient with you. I mean, how did Jesus know that he'd asked or said that he wanted to put his hands into his scars, his finger in his side? How did he know that? Well, because Jesus had been there. Jesus knows the bottom of our hearts. Jesus knows our desires, hears our words, sees everything and loves us patiently. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Jesus has patient love with us. Just a little pause. If you're a Christian, if you know this Jesus, I wonder if you're that patient with others. Patient with people who are wounded and struggling and have been struggling for a long time. Are you somebody who helps pick up lost sheep and bring them back home? Who goes out and finds lost sons, even people who've been walking away from Jesus forever? Are you patient with them? as patient with others as Jesus has been patient with you? 
That's the second thing we see, isn't it? Jesus' patient love, patient grace, giving Thomas more than he really needs. Isn't that what Jesus has done with us? Coming to meet us where we are, answering and, and coming to be patient with us, even when we're, um, even when we're stubborn, even when we really don't deserve it, even when we've embarrassed ourselves by putting conditions up there, by standing on our high horse and making him come to us. He willingly comes to love and serve, to seek and save the lost. So, okay, we've got Thomas's stubborn doubt. We've seen Jesus's patient love. And the finally, final thing, well, Thomas gets it. Finally, somebody gets it. I mean, what does Thomas say? He doesn't just doubt. Verse 28, Thomas doesn't go and put his fingers in Jesus' hands and side. Thomas, it's as if he falls down on his knees as soon as he sees Jesus, hears him say what he says, and he's that faith that's kind of been buried under all of his doubts and suspicions all of a sudden comes exploding back out of his mouth, out of his heart, and he says, my Lord and my God. Finally, somebody gets it. And you'll see, if you read through the whole Bible, you read through the whole of John's gospel, all the other gospels, stories of Jesus's life, nobody says anything like that, as clear as that. There's lots of hints, there's lots of times that people say, yeah, Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is Lord, that they come and fall at his feet. But this is the clearest, most obvious highest statement of who Jesus is, right at the end of the gospel, right at the end of John's story, where he says to us, the last couple of verses we read in verse 30 and 31, he says there are lots of other things Jesus did, lots of other stories I could tell you, but I've chosen this story right at the end of my story. In chapter 20 of his long book, I've chosen this story of somebody who says, Jesus is Lord and he's God. I wonder if you've said that. I wonder if you've recognised what Thomas recognised. I wonder if you've ever had a moment where it's just been so clear to you. You've still got questions, you've still got struggles, still got doubts, but all of a sudden faith comes rushing up. You see who Jesus really is. And you almost can't help but say, you're my Lord. You're the one that is at the center of my life, the one who should be middle, front, um, ruler, king of everything. And actually not just that, not just the one that I follow, but the one that I bow to and worship, my God. That's what John has been trying to tell us. It's what Jesus has been trying to tell us through the whole of this story. John chapter 8, if you want to flick back and look at it later. Jesus says, he has no sin. Chapter 8 again, Jesus says, if you know me, you've known the Father. Chapter 8 again, Jesus says, before Abraham was, that great ancient character in the Old Testament, before Abraham was... I am. Jesus takes the title of God himself that Moses heard in the burning bush. This title that means uncreated one, uncaused or the source of all life. That's what I am means. Jesus says, I am about himself. Jesus has been building up to this all along and then finally Thomas twigs it, sees it in his scars, in his knowing exactly what Thomas had in his heart, this stubborn doubt. He sees who Jesus is, and he can't help but say, my Lord and my God. You see, that's what makes you a Christian. Somebody who recognizes that truth, that Jesus is God, and then who says it and lives it. Not just, oh, you are God. Not just knowing some truth, but saying you are my God, making that truth personal. Do you see that? Um, it's one of my favorite things to do is to ask people, if you were to sum up the good news of Jesus, sum up the gospel with one verse from the Bible, what, what verse would you pick? Most people go to like John 3, 16. Uh, you know, for God so loved the world, he sent his only son. Whoever believes in him shouldn't perish, doesn't have to die, but has eternal life. That's a pretty good way of summing up the gospel. But a man called Martin Luther, really significant in Christian history, he said his favourite way to sum up the gospel was to go to the Song of Solomon, this kind of obscure book of love poetry in the Old Testament. You can look it up, Song of Solomon, chapter 3, and you'll find in there this little half verse where the woman turns to the man, the lover turns to her husband and says, my beloved is mine and I am his. That's another way of saying what Thomas says here, right? You're my Lord, the highest thing in my life. You're my God, my creator. Not just there is a God and I kind of believe in him generally, but this God is my God. I wonder if you've made that your prayer. 
I wonder if you have come to him as your God, not just when you needed something, not just when you were going through some troubled times and you kind of called out to him and forgot about him quickly soon afterwards. I wonder if he is your God, your Lord, the one who belongs to you. I wonder how your faith is doing. Have you started on that road? Have you had that Thomas moment where you still got doubts, you still got questions, you still got things you want to know about, but, but you can't help it anymore but see that he is who he says he is. Have you come to him? Or maybe, you've, maybe you did that years ago, but these doubts keep cropping up. These struggles keep making your heart cold towards Jesus. Well, can I give you a few practical things to take home to do from this story that would maybe start that faith up to begin, to begin with, if you're not a Christian yet, or if you have been a Christian for a while and you've just grown a bit cold, things that will keep you, um, get you burning again. Four things I want you to see in this story. We've seen a couple of them already, but let's just note them again. Four things to take home and do. First is, listen to the apostles. Listen to the apostles. That's what Thomas didn't do. I think that's why John puts this here at the end of the story. He's saying, look, we've seen Jesus. We were there, tasted fish on the beach that he cooked with his resurrected hands. That's next week's story. We were there and heard his voice, not a ghost, not some apparition, not some strange kind of psychological experience where we really wanted him to be alive and we also, no, we saw him alive bodily time and time again over a period of weeks. We saw him. Will you trust us? Will you believe us? Will you read these stories and let Jesus walk off the pages of that, of that story and into your life? We need to listen to the apostles, to read the words of their stories, to watch Jesus in action, to hear what he says, to see how he treats people. If you feel like Jesus has kind of receded into the background of your life, if you feel like you've gone coals to him, maybe it's because you haven't read one of these accounts recently. Maybe it's because you've just been going off the secondhand accounts of other people, off old stuff you learned in church back in the day. Can I encourage you? Listen to the apostles. Go get your Bible out. Open up John's gospel, Mark's gospel, Luke's gospel, and read about Jesus. Ask that if he's really there and risen, he would walk off the pages of scripture and into your heart. That's thing number one. Listen to the apostles. Do what Thomas didn't do. Listen to what they say, the ones who really saw him, the eyewitnesses. Two, see how patient he is with Thomas. That was our whole second point, wasn't it? Jesus' is, Jesus is loving patience, patient love. Well, come and see how patient he's been, not just with Thomas, but with you as well. How did he know what Thomas had said? How did he know to say word for word, Thomas, come and do what you asked to do? Well, because he was there. Because the risen Jesus is present with us, seeing what we do, hearing what, he say, what we say, all of our broken promises, noticing all of our flows, he, full flaws. He knows us down to the bottom, the ugliest depths of our hearts, all the things we've done in secret that nobody else knows anything about. He knows all of those things. And he looks at you today and says, I still love you. I promise never to leave you or forsake you. I know you. That's what Thomas realises. That's what breaks his heart and, and makes faith bubble up in him, that he sees Jesus has been there all along and that he still loves him. I wonder if you've seen that. Listen to the apostles. See how patient he's been with you. Number three, look at his wounds. It's not just a God who knows everything, a God who loves us in some gentle sen general sense, but Jesus has gone to the cross to die for you. He's the God who has scars. A poem I've mentioned a couple of times, it goes like this. The other gods were strong, but thou was weak. They rode, but thou did stumble to a throne. To our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. And not a God has wounds, but thou alone. That's a poem written by a soldier, a soldier from World War I who went through horrific suffering, but trusted in God because the God he knew had scars. It's a poem called The Jesus of the Scars. You can go and read it if you want to. But that's the God that there is. The one who's Lord, the one who's God. He's not just a teacher. He's not just here to inspire us a little bit. But he's alive. Alive after dying for us. For you and for me. So come and look at his wounds. And see if that doesn't make your heart burn with love for him. He's not just here to tell you what to do. To give you some inspiration to try and live a better life. He's here to show you that he loves you, that he's willing to go to, to his death, to wash you, to
to take all that you deserve on his own shoulders, to take it away once and for all, so that your past can be changed, that there's no guilt in the past, so your present can be filled with him. No loneliness anymore. No guilt. Your past is gone. No loneliness in the present. He's there with us to transform us, to walk with us. And your future's changed as well. Because he has wounds, because he's risen from the dead, your future's changed to be like him. One day you'll live in a rehabilitated body. You'll live in a new body like he does. You'll have hope in the future. You see, Jesus' resurrection, Jesus' scars, Jesus' life changes our past, changes our present, changes our future. So come and look at his wounds. Come and see what he's done. And last of all, forget your conditions. All of us have those kind of things that we've said to God before, haven't we? Lord, I'll come and I'll believe in you. I'll trust in you if that exam goes well. If you help me do this, do that. If you can get me through this. If I can marry that person. I'll trust you. I'll come to you. If you'll just help me this one last time. Thomas drops those conditions, doesn't he? He doesn't come and touch Jesus, even though Jesus says, come on, come on then, Thomas. He just falls on his knees and says, my Lord and my God. He sees that if he brings his conditions to Jesus, really those are the things that are his Lord. Those are the things that are his God, his eyes, his senses, his things that he holds most dear. Those are the things that are his God until Jesus turns up dying for him, rising for him, being patient with him, loving him. And then all of a sudden, everything changes and he realizes who Jesus is. All those conditions recede into the background and he says, oh, crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon the throne. Behold in his hand, his side, rich wounds yet visible above, in beauty glorified. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee and crown him as thy matchless king throughout eternity. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for thou hast died for me. And crown him, come on, crown him with many crowns throughout eternity. Those are the words of a pretty famous Christian hymn. Um, maybe you can search it up and look for it and make it your own song. But there's that question for you as we go. Are you somebody with stubborn doubts? Well, come and deal with those. Come and ask those questions. Come to Jesus and ask him to help you. And as you come to him, you'll see his patient love. You'll see his scars. And I wonder if you today, maybe for the first time, will cry out, my Lord and my God. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for you have died for me. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you did this for us. We thank you that you went to the cross, patiently serving and loving people like us, Lord, we do have so many questions. We do have lots of doubts. Doubts before we come to you. Doubts after we do. Lord, we're sorry for how we're so stubborn in those doubts so often. Lord, we ask that you would be patient with us. That you would love us as you love Thomas. That you'd help us to believe in you, even though we don't see you right now. Help us to look forward to the day when we will. Lord, help us to know life in your name as we come and trust you. Um, Lord, we pray that you would put Christians around us who can help answer our questions. We pray that you'd help us as we read the stories about you, all the things that you did and said in this life, on this earth. Lord, we pray as we read those stories, the witnesses of the apostles. Lord, we pray that you would help us to see who you really are and that we would come and trust you. Lord, we want to say, as Thomas did, my Lord and my God, we pray that you would help us to do that and to live for you, to be patient with others, to love others, Lord, as you've loved us first. Amen.
Jealous for our full devotion Till your glory is revealed May our hearts be holy passion Yearning for our home above Where at last redeemed and adopted We'll forever know your love Thank you Father Your love is all we need Thank you You, our God, you most fair and great, first of all things. Our hearts admire you, our hearts adore you, our hearts love you. Our lives as full as they are, we would empty before you, the one who fills us up. When we spend time with you, 10,000 thoughts delight our souls. 10,000 sources of joy are unveiled, 10,000 reasons to praise are exposed. We bless you today, what you have made us. Souls which are sanctified, bodies which are strengthened, senses which relish. We bless you today that you have given us full tables and cups that overflow, friends, families and neighbours. We bless you today that you have called us to serve others around us, to feel sorrows and wonder. Yet in all this abundance, we love you more than language can express. Not for what you give, but for who you are. Increase our love for you, our God, always. Amen. Well, thank you so much, John, for uh, opening up that passage to us, helping us to see ourselves in the story of Thomas ourselves as recipients of Christ's graciousness to us and the blessings that we have in him. Um, thank you for sharing from John chapter 20 uh, and I want to leave us with these words that Jesus performed many of the signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God and that by believing you may have life in his name. You know, we exist as a church to know Jesus more and to make Jesus more known because we believe that in Jesus, the truth, there is life for each and every one of us. Can I uh, beg your pardon for a moment, grab your attention and borrow your prayers this week? Just to let you know that myself and a few others from the church will be heading into Askol Dufferin Amman this week to do lessons almost every day uh, in the RE department, uh, working together with something called Jesus Live uh, Teaching, a specially uh, curated lesson for the children there in Dufferin Amman to, to help them to see and to grapple with um, the Christian view that we have on forgiveness, uh, fears and hope and uh, reconciliation. Um, so would you be praying for myself? Would you be praying for others? Would you be praying for the staff and the students in Eskol Dufferin That as we come and as we offer Christ as our hope, Christ as our answer to the questions that life's, uh, life throws up at us, that they would see much in John's sort of scheme of things, that they may see the Son, they may believe in the Son, and in him find life. I'd so appreciate your prayers as we go about that. Other than that, there's not much uh, to say that's going on in the life of the church. 
um, drop a comment, uh, send us an email, head over to the website, get in touch, let us know that you have been a part of today's service, especially if you've got any questions about things that have been said or you've got any questions about us, the church, our life together. We'd love to connect with you. We'd love to be able to have that opportunity to answer your questions. Leave a comment if that's how you're listening or head over to amphorchurch.com forward slash contact if you want to get in touch that way or perhaps pluck up the courage and join us next Sunday in Llanderbeer Memorial Hall at 10.30 in the flesh. That would be wonderful to have you along. So may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace in Jesus' name. Amen.